Page 57, Chapter 8, Order or Confusion, and um, this is, um, <clears throat> this whole chapter is explainable by the charts. Um, basically, it has a chart of, um, in a box, of the different uh, troubles and trials that we've mentioned so far. T plus T. It's okay. The, the box it looks something like this, and it's got. Let's see. What we got? One, two, three, four, five. Okay. One, two, three, four, five. All right. And these are the, in this box are the five circles, and the first one represents chastisement. This is second one is the sufferings of Christ. Third one is the testings of God. Fourth one is the tempting of Satan. The fifth one is common afflictions. But I also drew this little bottom thing here and just called it T and T, troubles and trials. And basically, most. Christians don't recognize the different categories. They just feel like they've been hit by TNT, troubles and, and trials. And they don't, they don't see any sort of differentiation between them. And so usually there's just a negative response. <clears throat> um, so I basically I'm just going through the charts here. But if that dealing is, um, for example, the temptations of Satan, then everything else is sort of blotted out, and they realize that it's not just troubles and trials that I'm having. I'm being under attack of the enemy, and I know that I'm supposed to resist the devil, and he will flee from me. Is that what the Word of God says? Okay. Um, on the other hand, if it's, if it's a situation where it's the sufferings of Christ, then again, it's no longer troubles and trials. It's not just TNT hitting you. It is, and then therefore they know how to respond. In the first situation, if it was the temptation of Satan, they would resist the devil and he would flee. In this situation, if it's the sufferings of Christ, then it talks about a response of joy. The Lord has to explain that to you. All right. On page 60, I have a <clears throat> larger chart. And it is these um, four, four of these areas, chastisement, suffering of Christ, testing of God, and temptation of, of Satan, are divided up and are put into categories. Those are the names of the afflictions that have come against us. In the second section there, it says the source. Who is the source of chastisement? It is the Father. Who is the, uh, and I want to correct a couple of them on here. Who is the source of the sufferings of Christ? Well, the truth is, yes, the Romans crucified Christ, but the scripture says he came into his own, and his own received him not. And I will tell you that you are more likely to suffer, you're, you're more likely to experience the sufferings of Christ by Christians than you are your government or something. <laughs> you know. Um, and then the response uh, or the, the source of the testings of God is God and the source of the temptations of Satan is Satan. The response to chastisement is sorrow and repentance the response to the suffering of Christ, of Christ is blessedness. The response of the testing of God is to rejoice, and the response of the tempting of Satan is to resist. The reason given, now the reason for the chastisement, it says disobedience, but we discussed that when we discussed chastisement, that not all of it is disobedience. Some of it is 
that God has to bring us in to an understanding of things that we don't understand as yet. It is correcting our course, but it's not just because you're just wrong or evil or something like that, okay? All right, sufferings of Christ. Usually you suffer because you're, I put obedience, but it means you're in tune with God, you know. You're, you've been with the Lord and people are attacking you, not because you're bad, but because you're with the Lord. Um, the testing of God, the reason is um, because it's a test. Temptation of Satan, the reason is because it's temptation to disobedience. Okay, and then the last category is the, whose choice is it to bring this about? When it comes to chastisement, it's the Father specifically, not God, but the Father's. Uh, the sufferings of Christ, that's our choice. We choose to suffer with him. Okay, and this is what Paul prayed, that he might do that. Uh, the, our, what is our choice in the testing of God? Well, it's not our choice. I mean, it is our choice. God, God will test us, but we're supposed to be in tune with him and, uh, and what he's trying to test us concerning. And then the last one is the temptations of Satan. And that relates to, I put God and Satan because like in the situation with Job, God allowed him in. All right, we're done with that chapter. Feeling pretty good, aren't you? <laughs> um, excuse me, let me have a little drink here. Yeah. All right, page 63, the, it's chapter 9, and it's called Labor Pains. I'm going to say this. I'm going to say let's not confuse labor pains with travail. Here's what I mean. <laughs> it is the same thing, but it's not the same thing in religious definitions. Travailing is a thing that uh, religious people have picked up. And it is travailing not that Christ may come forth, but just probably considered a deeper form of, of prayer. Wouldn't you say that, John? Yeah. And, uh, and I'm all for, <laughs> God knows, I'm all for deeper forms of prayer. But I think we need to be, I think we need to be clear on our definitions and that our definitions should line up with, with God's definitions. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to run you through a few scriptures here uh, before we talk about it. The first one is Galatians 4.19. You're well familiar with it. Galatians 4.19. This is Paul speaking to the churches of Galatia. My little children, of whom I travail in birth again until Christ be formed in you. All right, I, I will come back to that, but I, wanna, I want you to see sort of a, a pattern here. Let's go to Romans 8. Romans 8. And verse 22. Um, and let's start with verse uh, 21. Because the, the creation itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. And I... I think that word, Mallory, is that word sons of God there? This is uh, Romans 8, 21. Anyway, if you can, if you can check it out. Uh, For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. And notice the groaneth and travaileth. And this is, um, this is a waiting, a waiting. This is the creation. Um, 
is not settled. It is not at ease. It is not uh, uh, at rest. It is travailing. It is travailing for the sons of God. Did you have a comment, Jim? Verse 19. Thank you. Verse 19, for the earnest expectation of the creation waited for the manifestation of the sons of God. Thank you. Perfect. Perfect. All right. So there's an expectation. And, you know, if a woman gets pregnant, there's an expectation, right? I mean, there's not just, a, well, I guess I'm just going to get fat and that's going to be it. You know what I mean? Or, well, you know, get larger because i got a baby here. Or that, you know, um, this is just a passing fad. I mean, uh, I remember when I was... Uh, went into the military and uh, had a friend. He was 17 years old. He was already married and his wife was already pregnant. And so he went into the military to, to get some money to try to help him through. And he was a good guy, but man, he was just 17, you know. And, uh, and at that time, I was a big 19. And uh, <clears throat> he had this dream, he said, he woke up one morning and said, oh, my God, it was so real. I said, what? And he said, I had this weird dream. He said, a dream that my wife got pregnant, and she just got bigger and bigger and bigger. And one day she just started going down and down and down, and then it was over. And we looked at each other and went, hmm, I wonder what that was all about. That doesn't happen. Okay. There's a purpose. There's an expectation. You, know, you following that? There's an expectation the, for the, earn, the earnest expectation waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. And the word manifestation can also be translated revealing, but it, but it is better translated manifested because they're there, they're just not manifested, okay? And, uh, and that's, that's we'll, we'll develop that as we go here. But to see that there is this Again, there is this expectation of something that has not yet come. And that even Paul's praying for it with the church. The whole earth is groaning and travailing because that's the end purpose of it all. Okay? That's the end purpose of it all. <clears throat> all right, and then finally... Um, John chapter 16. A woman, this is verse 21, sorry. John 16, 21. <clears throat> A woman, when she is in travail, hath sorrow because her hour is come. But as soon as she is delivered of the child, she remembereth no more the anguish for joy that a man is born into the world. All right, so Jesus is actually equating this, if you check the context, he's equating this to his death and to his coming forth, his resurrection. Uh, verse 20, verily, verily, I say unto you, ye, sh ye shall weep and lament, which is like travail, okay? Um, but the world shall rejoice, and ye shall be sorrowful, but your sorrow shall be turned into joy. As if a woman has life inside of her, but it is not yet seen by anybody. You have life in you. Is it being seen? Has it been brought forth? See, um, And... Uh, it, it'd be like holding an apple seed. I could hold an apple seed in my hand and I could say there's life in that. But that seed, unless it falls into the ground and dry, dies, there's not going to be a manifestation of life. Does, is there life there? Yes. That would, be like, that would be like a woman that gets pregnant and she's in her first month or something like that. And, and she says... Uh, uh, she says, I'm pregnant. And you say, well, you don't look pregnant to me, you know. Oh, no, I've got life in me. Well, I don't see, I don't see him, you know what I mean? I don't see Jesus. I don't see him. Well, he's in there. Well, don't you think it would be better if you showed him? 
if you came forth, you see. All right. So um, there, is a, there is a travail, but this travail is to bring forth Christ. Okay. That's either Christ or Christ in you in the terms of being um, sons of God, the manifestation of the sons of God, sons in the image of Christ, sons that are going, that their purpose is to be the vehicle of his expression in the earth. Right. So, um, uh, you see, and we've talked about some of these things before. Over in uh, Galatians 4, we talked about this some time back, but it applies in this situation again. Galatians 4, verse 1. Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, differeth nothing from a servant, though he be lord of all. Okay, so what is this all, what is this going to, um, where is this going to go? This person is in the family. He's an heir of God. He's in the family. He's born again. All right, well, here's where it's going to go, and here's the end. Not the salvation, not, not a great harvest at the end of the world, as people think. Of, of souls, but a great harvest of the seed of Christ coming forth in the church. Okay, now I don't mind personally if there's a great harvest of people getting one to the Lord at the end, but you've heard me talk quite a bit about it I, and and point to many scriptures. And this this is another example right here. Okay, so the, you're in the family. What's the end goal? What is the thing? For you to become a great evangelist so that you win all these souls at the end, so that this is the, the harvest is a harvest of souls. No, the harvest is a harvest of the seed that was planted in the dirt. Okay. It, the seed was already in it. And so you see that in verse uh, 5 uh, or 6. And because ye are sons now, God hath sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. And, and so now you're no more servant. Now you're no more, you know, and this, is, this all relates to the Father's dealing with us. The Father deals, wants to deal with us as sons. He either deals with us as children or as sons. If he deals with us as sons, he deals with us as Christ in us. He, he says, you want the son to come forth, and I'm going to do everything I can to bring him forth in you. All right. But now we're talking, you know, we're talking about troubles and trials. Well, labor pains <laughs> is a trouble and trial. You know what I'm saying? Uh, ask any woman. You know, it is, a, it is a trouble and a trial, and it is going through a lot of anguish. Well, Jesus spoke to that, and he said, now, there is travail. And he was, he was speaking of his death. Remember that? I mean, 16, John 16. Read it real, I mean, if you get a chance, just read it real close, all the context and stuff. This is his explanation of what's going on. He's not saying, well, I'm just going to die and then, you know, I'm going to be resurrected. That's, I mean, that's kind of the way we all see it. You know, well, Jesus died and he rose again. But he sees it as a a giving of birth. Life comes out of death and birth, you know, how would you say it? Birth comes out of travail. Birth. Birthing, bringing forth Christ. And so it is in the Father's mind, he's got one goal then. If I could say it like this, he's not near as interested in having a great harvest of salvations at the end of the thing as much as he is interested in having a great manifestation of Christ in us. A great manifestation. Oh, man. 
if you understood that, then you, you would understand the last feast. You would understand the feast of the ingathering. It's not, you know, oh, a bunch of dirt received seed. No, a bunch of seed that was in the dirt has brought forth manifestation of him. That's the feast of the ingathering. That's clearly what it's, it's talking about in the Old Testament. <clears throat> All right, so are you a son or a child? Well, if you're, this says, um, let's read verse 1 again. Now say that the heir, as long as he is a child, differeth nothing from a servant, though he be lord of all, but is under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the father. Okay, these tutors and governors, these are people that are servants to the master. I'm giving you the Old Testament meaning. They're servants to the master to take care of that kid and to train that kid, but to, but to bring him to brokenness. But no amount of tutors and governors makes a son, makes a child into a son. They don't do it, I'm sorry. They bring him to a certain state of brokenness. We can understand that brokenness, but when you get to that, that state of brokenness, then rushes in the spirit of his son crying, Abba, Father. It doesn't cry, I'm free, or you know, whatever, all the things that we would think, all the religious things that we would think, well, Jesus is in me, and now I'm, I'm healed, or I'm this and that. No, it cries, Abba, Father, because it is pure son. Pure son. Okay. Once that's the case, Everything, everything changes then, okay? So those tutors and governors, we go, well, why, why, you know, and this is another example because it's, it's just trying to bring us to labor pains, you know, and it's, well, why is this happening and why did that happen and why didn't the Lord do this and then why is that the way that it is and why are these tutors and governors always p driving me and pushing me and da-da-da-da? Well, clearly you haven't reached the why. Because the why is where you, <coughs> you are ready for God to reveal his son in you. It, it becomes now, you're, it's an issue of travail to you now. It's an issue of travail. God wants to bring forth his son. This is not God hating me. This is not God punishing me. This is not things are out of control. This is not things are out of whack. This is the faithfulness of the Father. Amen. The faithfulness of the Father. Amen. All right. So, um, you know, those, and, and it talks about that here and in other places. Those tutors and governors are the elementary elements of this world. In other words, they would be like being in elementary school. <laughs> if you're still having to be, you know, uh, what is, what's that scripture saying? Psalms about uh, that he he leads a horse by bit and bridle. Yeah, yeah. That he has to put that thing in your mouth and he has to put those that that bridle on you and say over here this way. And that thing hurts. Did you know that? I mean, people don't realize, but I mean it, that's why he moves. You know. And he goes okay. And then you put him on a leash and you pull him here and there. And everything, God, and God is using that example to say, I don't want to do this to you, but I have to. This is you'll never get there because you're so stubborn. Can I get amen? amen. You know, it's like you, you know, it's like at first you're a jackass, and then you become a thoroughbred. <laughs> All right, so. Um, the, these elementary things can never graduate you. They can never graduate you. You're going to have to let them do their work, you know. And that's what I was thinking about that today, about Job, you know, how interesting it said. I think it's in the book of James where he says, uh, you know, you know, keep your place right here. It's some great stuff, actually. Over in the book of James, I didn't even look it up. I was just meditating on it. Um, I 
Yes. Okay, uh, it's James chapter 5, verse 7. James 5, 7. <clears throat> Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Okay, so, so our main picture that we get is that he's going to come in the skies. Okay, but he's going to give an ex he's going to give a different example. Okay, he's going to give an earthly example. <clears throat> he says, "Be patient." Okay, so this patience. Let me let me explain it. Uh, you'll see it shortly. This patience has to do with revealing Christ in you. Because what is it going to what is it going to get to shortly? The patience of Job. What was, the, what was the fruit of the patience of Job, of his patience? And that God was commending a man for his patience. He wasn't just going, well, you know, it's good to have patience. This was, look, if anybody ever went through crap, Job went through it. Okay? If anybody ever really didn't have a reason for all this stuff coming on. And that's one reason why Job was resisting everything and fighting against it because he was like, this isn't right. I've done good, you know. And, you know, and he even said stuff like, well, what's the point of serving God if you do everything right and this happens and you look worse than these guys that are telling me I'm wrong? All right. You know, great human arguments. They are. They're great human arguments. The problem with it is that God is trying to reveal his son in Job. Okay? That's the goal. Then when that happens, end of story. There's a little more, and I'd love to share it with you. It's even better than you think. But I don't want to get off too much. So let's look at this. So be patient, therefore, brethren, under the... Okay, so there it is. He didn't just say, be patient, Christians. Buddhists, be patient. Uh, Hindus, be patient. Christians, join in. You be patient, too. No! Be patient in these trials. I mean, pretty much all we know of Job was trials and everything being taken away. He didn't start, you know, by gaining all this. He's already reached what we would call the pinnacle. This is it. We have done it right. And then, then God goes. <laughs> and then the whole book is about bringing him into the revelation of Christ. Okay, I've seen, I've heard of thee by the hearing of the ear, but now I see thee face to face and I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. Okay. There's the, consider the end of Job and his patience. Look at the example. Behold, the farmer waited for the precious fruit of the earth. <laughs> Anybody see? Do you see that? This is patience for the harvest. The harvest is the coming forth of Christ. And he proves it by using Job just a few verses down. Okay? Precious fruit of the earth and hath long patience for it until he received the early and the latter rain. Okay, so he's the, the farmer goes out. He goes, okay, I want the Lord. I want the coming forth of the seed. I got a lot of seed, you know. You can hold it in your hand, you know. You could reach into a bag and go, look, I got life. I got seed. I got stuff. But this farmer says, no, I want the manifestation of the seed of Christ. All right. So he goes out. He looks at his hard ground. <laughs> And get amen. amen. <laughs> he looks at his hard ground and he goes, oh boy, <laughs> you know, I need tutors and governors. You're going to break up the ground. You, folks, you can break up the ground. You can become broken and soft and still not be what God wants. He wants you broken and soft so the seed can come in you and then eventually bring forth. All right. But there ain't going to be any seed coming forth. I mean, the parable of the sower tells us that if we're not broken and soft. Amen? I mean, they're, I mean, come on. You know, that is a prerequisite. That's what's called, that's what he calls good ground. Some seed, same seed, could have had the same potential, but it had rocks and junk, you know. So the farmer looks at his ground and he goes, okay, oh boy. You know, so he starts plowing. And is it easy to plow? No. Is it easy when when you hit a big rock and it breaks your blade, 
Is it easy when your horse breaks a leg or something like that? You know, I'm, I'm thinking of the plowing in those days, you know. And so all of these trials are hitting you because what? Because you're trying to do the right thing. You're trying to have a harvest of the seed. Okay, so then you plant the seed, and then the fowls, all these birds, all this stuff, you put up a scarecrow, and then the beetles and stuff start coming, and da da da, da and you're just going, it seems like God is against me trying to do his will. <laughs> Anybody ever felt that way? Yeah. <clears throat> okay, good. Because that's probably a good sign. <laughs> I'm, you know, Job did too. See, it talks about the patience of Job, but all it means is that he kept going even though he got mad. All right, just remember that. All right, so, so it says, you know, so he, he, after going through all of this stuff and after a long period of time, all of a sudden, the thing that it was all about. See, it never was about not having worms that eat your thing. You know what I mean? It wasn't about not having rocks that broke your thing, set you back financially, made you have to go into town, all the way into town, buy it, come back, put it on, da 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 da, sweating, hot, da 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 da. Okay, so behold, the farmer waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth and hath long patience for it until he received the early and the latter rain. All right, the early rain is when it falls on us and we're going, woo this is the early part of the revelation of Christ. Whoa, see it, Jesus is just so good, you know? I love this. Yeah, keep those arms up because we're going to nail you up here in a minute. <clears throat> anyway, <clears throat> stay right there. <laughs> And then the, but then the latter rain, you're just like, oh my God, please, I need, you know, yeah. you know. Long, long patience, you know, okay. Um, verse 8, be ye also patient. Establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord draw nigh, meaning it's, it's coming. You just need to quit being set back by everything, you know, and, and discouraged as if it's not going to happen. Verse 9, murmur not one against another, brethren, lest you be judged. Behold, the judgment standeth before the door. Okay, and, and why would they throw that in in a situation like that? Well, my God, isn't that exactly what happened in the wilderness when they're trying to get into the promised land and they start way back here at Egypt and working. And those who go in, Moses, Joshua, Caleb, People are always murmuring against them. Well, you could have done this better. Well, this trip would have been a lot easier if we had air conditioners. <laughs> I don't know. You know what I mean? I mean, there's a, it's just like uh, you can, f when you're not tuned like that, then it's like, I mean, can you see Joshua and Caleb? Let's go, man. We're getting closer. Every step, we're getting closer. Let's do it. Let's do it. Let's do it. Come on, guys. Let's do it. You know, I can see some people standing back there walking together go. I just hate that Caleb. He thinks he's so spiritual. He just holds his head up. Yeah, let's go. Come on. Yeah, yeah. It's as if he never has any problems like we do, you know. And, you know, Joshua, he took a wrong turn, and that's, we, that's why we've been out here 40 years. <laughs> All right. Verse 10. Take, my brethren, the prophets who have spoken in the name of the Lord for an example of suffering, affliction, and of patience. Does anybody, is a prophet name come to anybody's not mind? Anybody? Who? Jeremiah. Jeremiah. Beautiful. Anybody else? Ezekiel. Ezekiel. Isaiah. These guys, if I started telling you the stuff they went through, and much of what they went through was just to be a sign of the cross. That's what it was. And God wanted them to be fellowship in his sufferings. That's why they were in it. He, didn't, he wanted them to manifest on earth what is true in heaven. Okay? All right. So uh, then next verse, verse 11. Behold, we count them happy who endure. Okay. So there it is. We don't count them happy who are going through the process, but who have endured. 
who have, who have made it to the end. Okay, so, so you have heard of the patience of Job and have seen the end of the Lord. All right, glory to God, what wording. Can you get any better than that? You got the patience of Job going through all this affliction, but then you see the manifestation of what? The end of the Lord. This is what God had in mind. And now he sees, he sees the Lord and all of a sudden he goes, oh man, you know, I was so self-righteous and I thought I had it together and now I abhor myself. But now he sees the Lord. Now he sees the Lord. And that the Lord was very pitiful and of tender mercies. Okay, now. Do you think during the majority of the book of Job that he thought that the Lord was very pitiful and of tender mercy? You can read his own words. <laughs> he didn't. Okay. So wh what does that say? Because he did find the end of the Lord, did he not? Yes, he did. Okay, so what does that tell us? It tells us that you can get off Hello? You can blame God, you can blame others, you can murmur, you can do all that, but you better hold fast to the Lord and be patient, my brethren, for the coming of the Lord, not being patient for patience' sake. Amen? And that's what we're talking about. So what, how does that apply? Oh, it applies beautifully. We're talking about labor pains. Page 63, chapter 9. Labor pains. That these labor pains are exactly what God orders for who? Sons of God. You know? And so, and you see it with Paul. I am travailing in birth till, you know, Christ comes forth in them. And we, when we're in that situation, and Christ, and God, see, it's, it's confusing. It is, folks. It's confusing. It's confusing because we're going through labor pains, like in, in John 16, what Jesus meant when he said that we're going through labor pains, and we don't know why we're in all this pain. Have you ever, have you ever in the news heard of some teenage girl or something going to a bathroom or somewhere and have a baby and didn't even know she was pregnant? Anybody ever heard of that before? It, it's, it happens. Can you imagine what was going through her mind? It's like, oh, what? hey, what's wrong with me? You know? <laughs> and nothing's wrong with you. This is life comes out of death and birth comes out of travail. Okay? If you, and if you want Jesus to manifest in you where when, you know, like when they, they dragged Peter up before the Sanhedrin and he rebuked him and all this and then he sent him out. They, they whipped him, you know, beat him a couple of times and stuff and said, you know, they said they took note of him that he'd been with Jesus. It was, it was the, the bleeding, the, the aura, the whatever, the presence of the Lord, the reality of the Lord that affected them. It, they didn't say, well, that guy... That guy was a fisherman, wasn't he? he? He learned some stuff. You see what I'm saying, though? I mean, that's kind of the, that's the way it is in religion. Well, you know, I've learned some stuff. Uh, no, not really. You haven't. Because what you're supposed to learn, you know, remember what it says, what, what uh, well, I'm almost done here. What it says of, um, I love this. Um, I'll just, I'll just read it to you. It says, This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that you walk henceforth, walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind, having the understanding darkened, being alienated, not from God, folks, from the life of God, through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. Now listen to this. And this is great when it gets to the, to the point. Who being past feeling have given themselves over unto lasciviousness to work all uncleanliness with greediness. Listen, listen to what it says. But you, ye have not so learned Christ. This is not a situation of being a Christian. This is a situation of God 
bringing forth his son. That's his purpose. And if we keep thinking that he's trying to Christianize, <laughs> I mean, think of that. Just, just consider that for one moment. God is trying to Christianize us? Is really is that really what God's trying to do? Is he trying to Christianize us? Come on. He's trying to form his son in us. He wants Christ not just in us like he's in a seed, but where's the proof of life? But out of us by travail. And so we 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 misread these troubles and trials. Ben, you missed this, but it's troubles and, and trials. And then it's uh, S-O-S, stumbling blocks or stepping stones. <laughs> All right, so we misread what's going on and we think, well, this is the devil or this is out of control or this is this or this is that. And it's, it's all of those pains. It's, it's time to push harder, if you will. You, you know what I'm saying? It's time to push harder for the manifestation of the Christ. But if I push harder, it hurts more. Ah! Have you ever seen if nothing else on TV, but uh, you know, I got a wife and boy, you should hear her scream. I'm telling you, <laughs> oh baby, <laughs> I'm serious. <laughs> and then Jesus says in John 16, but when it is delivered, there is joy. That, uh, that life has come forth. Life has come forth. You tell me that's not the grandest end of Christianity. Christ coming forth in his body. The deserved one coming forth in his body. Finally, it's not us coming forth in his body. <laughs> Thank God. Thank God. Thank God. Don't you love it? Don't you love the Lord? Doesn't it make you want him more and more? Let's just pray. Father, we just thank you. We thank you for your grace and your mercy. We thank you that your compassions fail not. Your mercies are new every morning, and we can count on you. And so we don't want to harden or to doubt you uh, or to start questioning you over the pains that may be nothing more but than labor pains. So, Father, we ask you to keep us all. Maybe we're not all in that place at this moment, but when we come to those places, Lord, I ask for grace and mercy for each one of us here on Skype and that will listen to this later. I ask for grace and mercy that not just that they would get through it, but that Jesus would be the end result of it. He would come out of it and that we would find the end of the Lord, not just the patience of Job. Our rejoicing would not just be in our patience, that we made it. Our rejoicing would be that Christ came forth and that others would receive him and see him and experience in him in earthen vessels. Lord, this is your plan, Father. This is your plan for sons in the image of Christ. Not just you, but the whole earth groans waiting for this manifestation. We want to be a part of, we want to do something to help answer your prayers. You've always answered our prayers. We want to be involved in answering your prayers, that Christ would come forth in this earth, and this travail and groaning would be a manifestation of Christ in the sons of God. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're dismissed.